Hello, and welcome to Portfolio Matters. In today's share talk, we will be talking about the small London listed oil explorer with assets in Mongolia, Petro Matad. But before we do it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Keith, let's hear about Petro Metad. Thank you, Richard. Okay, so Petro Matad is a small UK listed oil company with frankly a long history of disappointing investors, but it is doing real wildcat exploration in Mongolia and has a resource that it found in its last drilling campaign that is valuable, but it now is awaiting exploitation licenses. So the company's current share price is 3.1p, valuing it at around 21 million. And in June 2020, it had cash of 2.1 million. Now it will be very rapidly running out of cash, despite cutting all executive pay by 50%. And so it's in the very near future, it is going to be need to do a share fundraising, a placing or rights issue of some kind. So in summary, this is a very interesting company with real wildcat assets in Mongolia and actually a, an increasing understanding of the geology. And I would say better prospects going forward than historically. And historically, it's been a big disappointment to investors. However, in the last drilling campaign, it found oil. It found the Heron well, which has estimated proven reserves of 33 million barrels. Now that's worth a lot of money. At $60 oil, that's worth best part of $2 billion. Now, obviously there will be expenses to get that oil out, but actually it's not difficult because there are refineries in Mongolia. Mongolia has to import fuel from China. Mongolia is currently building its own refinery and it needs uh, feedstock. So it should be keen to have the Heron field developed. However, we have now been waiting 18 months for the exploitation license. So the exploitation license was originally estimated to be granted by the Mongolian government in Q1 of 2020. Now, obviously, there's been a great deal of disruption because of COVID-19, but the bottom line is we still haven't got it. And the company are now guiding that they expect to receive it in Q1 2021, possibly slipping into Q2, but there are concerns in the chat rooms that they're not going to get it and that has definitely affected the share price but and the ceo specifically addressed that in the latest rns saying that there was no reason that he was aware of why the mongolian government should not grant the exploitation license but the bottom line is Right now, it's very much running out of the cash and it's going to need cash to develop this field and actually just to run the company. So I think we are waiting for the exploitation license to be granted. And as soon as it's granted, I think the company will be raising money. OK, so this is the share price. And you can see that some time ago, there's a lot of speculation about the company and the share price shot up to 36p and it's now down 90%. So what happened? And I'm going to apologize for how busy this chart is, but it's uh, to understand the history of the company, you really need to know what's happened. So we go back to early days, 2015. 
the company farmed out its blocks four and five to British Gas, to B BG Group, which was the exploration arm of, of British Gas. And for that, BG Group agreed to fund a $28 million work program and to give Petromatad $4.5 million. So there's quite a lot of excitement about the pros prospects of the company then, and you can see the share price rose nicely. Unfortunately, on the 15th of February 2016, Shell acquired BG, and the first thing they did was decide they didn't want these fields. They didn't want to be involved in the farm out. So they relinquished the farm out agreements. But thankfully, Petro Matad had put in break clauses. So as a result of that, Shell had to return the fields to 100% ownership of Petro Matad and give them $15 million. So then you see the shares went on a roll because this is this looks great. The company has 100% ownership of the fields and it's got $15 million with which to drill them. And then obviously there's quite a lot of speculation goes on. But then in 2017, they announced the drilling contract with the Chinese national oil company, Sinopec, and um, to, well, a Chinese oil company and two drilling targets. And the drilling targets are enormous. So Snow Leopard is 160 to 350 million barrels. Wild Horse is one of the largest wildcat exploration wells in the world, 280 to 650 million barrels. And so at $70 a barrel, you know, that field the, at the bottom end would be worth the best part of 20 billion. So these are huge prospects. Then did a fundraising at six and a half P, um, announced new estimates. And, you know, the mean estimate for Snow Leopards is 90 million and from Wild Horses upgraded to 490 million. So that is an absolutely enormous well. But then they start drilling. And frankly, the disappointment starts. So Snow Leopards dry and actually is worse than just dry. There's no oil or gas shows found at all. Um, Wild Horse dry. Um, it then announces a 2019 drilling campaign, Heron, Red Deer and Gazelle. Now, the 2019 drilling campaign, they have been more conservative. So while Snow Leopard and Wild Horse were real wildcats, they were out in the middle of nowhere, never been drilled before. Heron, Red Deer and Gazelle are drilled in Block 20, where which is very close to existing oil fields so they know that oil is around but you can see the targets are much smaller heron 25 million red deer 48 gazelle they don't i couldn't find a number for anyway heron finds oil and that well is now that field is now estimated to contain mean proven resources of around 33 million barrels and it also produces oil without lift. So there's not natural pressure in the res reservoir to push out 820 barrels a day. Whereas most other fields in the reservoir require artificial lift. Red Deer is dry. Gazelle One finds quantities of oil and gas, but they need to do an appraisal well, and they need to appraise that field. And thus far, they haven't had a chance. Then essentially the country goes into lockdown in 2020. And in mid-May, the company, all the executives take a 50% pay cut to preserve cash and professional advisors take a 45% fee reduction. And essentially, this is a company on life support at the moment. It's running out of cash, but it's got this field. And so now it needs to get the licenses and it needs to get actually relatively small amounts of money to develop those fields. So let's talk about oil in Mongolia. 
So you can see from the uh, bar chart at the top here, Mongolia does produce some oil, but it doesn't have any processing. All the processing uh, facilities are in China. This is the border here. So the oil is trucked out to the refineries and then Mongolia has to import all its refined products. But they are constructing a refinery here, the Mongol refinery, which the Indians in a piece of regional rail politique are funding to the cost of $1.25 billion. So the bottom line is the Mongolian government needs oil and it needs refined products and it's just built a refinery which needs feedstock. So there's a clear route to market. So this is from the latest, uh, so this is from uh, June 18, actually. So the idea would be that um, exports by road to refineries or to the then proposed refinery, but the refinery is being built and it should be completed by next year at a cost of uh, 1.25 billion. So all the oil would now be priced locally. So there is a great incentive for the Mongolian government to approve this well. So the logical question is, why is it taking so long? Okay, so this is an <coughs> overview of the company's exploration assets. We have, so Ulaanbaatar, the um, capital is here, and then you have blocks four and five, which are right out in the steppe and are real wildcat exploration targets. And then you have block 20, which is close to established oil fields shown in green. And this is what the um, terrain looks like. This is the steppe. So this is where their real exploration assets are. And if we look at their activity in um, block 20, so they drilled three wells. They built, drilled Gazelle 1, which has found oil, but we don't know how much. Heron 1, which now has estimated at 33. So that should be 33, the latest numbers of 33 million. And Red Deer, which showed well, it showed um, oil and gas shows, but nothing commercial. There are hydrocarbons present, but there are non-commercial quantities. So the Heron CPR, Competent Persons Report, estimating the size of the Heron resource, estimates that there are 194 million barrels in place, which was higher than the company's original estimate. And they also stated that the oil had substantial value given the low cost onshore operating environment and the favorable Mongolian tax regime. Now, what is the, the Mongolian tax regime? Well, corporation tax is very low, it's 10%. And these production sharing contracts are estimated to contain royalties of between five and 15%. Now, I have been unable to find the exact royalty contained in the Heron CPR, sorry, in the uh, royalty sharing agreement between Petro Matad and the Mongolian government. And I have emailed the company, but got no response so far. But anyway, it should be between five and 15%. Now, if you add those together, that is very favorable. If you remember watching our other share talk on Anglo Asian, Anglo Asian had to pay corporation tax and royalties of 50%. So it actually would only take home about a third of its earnings. Here, we're talking about Petro and Matad taking home at least 75%. So that is a very favorable tax regime. And they also stated that the um, if they were to use modern oil recovery techniques, then the recovery rate on Heron 
should be higher than in comparable fields. And they conservatively estimated recoverable resources of 33 million barrels, but there is upside potential there. Okay, so this is a you know, topological ge geological map of the Heron field. And what I'd like you to concentrate on is this white line here. Okay, so if we look at this next chart, this is the geology of the field along that white line. Now, the Heron field, Heron well, sorry, is here, and that down here is the Heron field. And you see, so oil has come up from below, and then it's hit this fault here and been trapped between the, st the uh, strata of the rock and this fault. So that small field there is Heron. However, the company estimates that oil and gas will have traveled up the strata elsewhere in the field and been trapped further along. And there is a potentially a much larger resource further along the trap. So there are drilling targets. And hopefully, Heron has a clear and easy route to market. All the oil will simply be trucked to uh, central processing facilities. Um, and there is power in place. So, you know, it should be quite simple, frankly. Now, an overview of block five, blocks four and five. Now, you will remember that Wild Horse, which was possibly the, la was the largest um, wild cat uh, prospect in the world, came up completely dry. Snow Leopard um, also came up dry, but there are still prospects in Fox. And so this is another um, view. And if you look at the map of Mongolia, it shows you where you are. The white dot is where I estimate Ulaanbaatar is, which is the capital. Now, Snow Leopard, there were oil shows, but no commercial oil. And there's an old well, TSC1, up here. And they have now identified other leads. So there's Phoenix, Fox Deep, Fox Shallow, and over here is there's the Raptors. And if we have a look at the Raptors, I mean, frankly, when I look at this, I think, why on earth didn't they drill these before? Because, I mean, Velociraptor here, that has the classic shape of an oil trap. It's a dome. So the oil and gas come up from below the earth and they get trapped in this dome. Whereas Snow Leopard was drilled over here. I mean, why on earth would they drill there? I mean, obviously this is 2D and Snow Leopard, the, the world is 3D, but still, you get the feeling that they are slowly gaining expertise in what these fields, the reservoir of these fields looks like. Um, so where are we? This was the work schedule for 2020. So last year. And as you can see, they were hoping to secure the exploitation license in Q1. We get permits to um, develop the field and in uh, Q1 and Q2. And then in Q3 and Q4, they're actually hoping to produce oil. So there'd be appraisal and drilling well, um, in Q3, which would rapidly lead to production. So, and they're estimating at 25 million um, barrels of oil, and we now know it's 33, they reckon NPV 10 is worth 150 million. Okay, so we, the, the current market cap is 20 million quid. So, and 25 million barrels, you're talking 110 million value to the company. So there is upside here. Okay, so what's the current status? Well, the reality is they're rapidly running out of cash, despite cutting all the um, 
executive salaries. They are awaiting the Block 20 exploitation license and the latest RNS from the company says expected Q1, end of Q1 or possibly beginning of Q2. And they're saying that essentially there's been a great deal of disruption in Mongolia due to COVID-19 and that the ministries are all working remotely and it just hasn't been possible to get everyone together to agree these things. Um, <clears throat> so these are the numbers and I mean, these aren't really very uh, important, frankly, because I mean, it's never made, never made any revenues apart from, you know, interest on its cash and farm out money. So what are the positives? Well, it's got two discoveries of which one, Heron, is very significant. I mean, at 33 million barrels and $60 oil, the total resource is worth, you know, that oil is worth about $2 billion. Now, uh, Keith, I was saying about they're only putting an NPV on it themselves of 120 million. Yeah, that's right. But that, that was, um, you know, a 25 million barrels. And so you'd say that's, um, you know, 33 million is a third higher. Yeah. So, you know, it's probably um, 160. But still, yeah, because you do have to, you know, there are very significant OPEX costs, et, et cetera. Yeah. But still, that's worth a lot of money for a company with, you know, 20 uh, market cap of 20 million. Yeah. So there is upside here. And Gazelle has not been flow tested. So Gazelle, you know, is it sounded marginal. But as the oil price increases, you know, who knows? We, we need to wait for them to uh, actually do the appraisal on Gazelle. Um, Mongolia has a new oil refinery and needs feedstock. So frankly, I can't see any reason why they wouldn't give this an exploitation license unless they, um, they wanted to um, uh, close it down and give the license to somebody else. You will be aware that um, the problems that Rio Tinto have had with the Oyu Toglu mine, copper mine in Mongolia, because of cost overruns and friction with the Mongolian government. So friction with the Mongolian government is not unheard of. But in this case, you know, Petro Matad have not had cost overruns. They've not done anything, you know, broken any promises to the government. So I can't see any reason why the government wouldn't want to give them this license. And after a series of dry holes, you would hope that Petro Matad are beginning to understand the geology of the field better, and perhaps they're stumbling towards competence. And there's still exploration upside in block five, and there's a near-term sharp price catalyst. Frankly, as soon as they get the exploitation license, you think, well, market cap's currently 20 million. There has to be a share placing, which is going to be dilutive. But, you know, the value of this field is what, um, 120 million quid. So, you know, there's upside here and the oil price is rising. So, you know, um, negatives. Well, it needs cash. And depending on what the source of cash is, whoever is providing the cash has Petro Matad over a barrel. Now, I don't think that Petro Matad need to go to dilutive sources of funding. I think shareholders will be very happy to provide them with the small number of resources they need to drill these wells and to develop these fields. Um, but a placing slash rights issue is almost certain. And we're still awaiting the block 20 exploitation license. And until it is received, we just don't know whether it will be granted. We expect it to be granted, but we don't know. And obviously, it's got a pretty terrible history of disappointing shareholders with the uh, its drilling campaigns. They were, you know, huge fanfare, very large prospects, and then dry holes. But hopefully, they're beginning to understand the geology better. 
and you would hope that their wells going forward had uh, better prospects of success. Richard, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Oh, it's very interesting presentation, Keith. Thank you very much. It um, it seems to hinge, doesn't it, on whether they get the exploitation license. They have a they have a, a resource which is clearly quite valuable, and is is a multiple of their market capital current market capitalization, or NPV of the multiple, and um, they need the exploitation license. Once they get that, presumably the uh, price will be re the company will be re-rated, um, yes. and the risk is that they don't get it, as you pointed out, the risk is they don't get the exploitation license or they run out of cash and it gets taken away from them because they can't, they don't have the resources to to actually put in place the, um, to put in place the exploitation facilities. So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a play on something that the company probably has very little control over. But as you point out, why would Mongolia not grant the exploitation license and also if they develop a reputation of allowing companies to come in and, and undertake exploitation and then they they take away the, the license and give it to another company they'll simply lose the goodwill that they need of the international um, natural resources development community and yeah. they will find that they suffer as a consequence so it doesn't really seem to make any sense for them not to grant it but oh, right. you never know do you so Clearly, it hinges on that, and that's why presumably that's why the market cap is, is where it is because people are very doubtful and they're not uh, happy. On the other hand, if you put in a small amount of money uh, that you're prepared to lose because it is a binary bet, this either it, it gets it or it doesn't get it. Um, if you put a small amount of money in, then your risk reward ratio is relatively low and your reward may be significant. So, yeah. of course, there's the upside potential further upside of um, other successful exploration, which may or may not happen but that's sitting there mm -hmm. as a potential yeah no i completely agree with you i mean frankly i own a decent amount of this company having bought it prior to the uh snow leopard and wa wild horse drill drilling campaigns yeah and i've held it throughout because heron is valuable and as soon as they get the the um exploitation license you would hope that the shares are going to re-rate. Now, the big question is, if they get the Heron license, and I think they will, but they need cash, now what terms are they going to do that placing? So you have the dilution of the placing, the need to commit cash um, for the placing, and then, so that's downside, and then, but there's upside of, you know, how much will the shares pop when the good news the exploitation license comes yeah out. and i'm no expert on this case but i can't if the if the well is already producing without any pressure then presumably they can they can sort of boot as long as they've got enough money to get the, the well properly in production and to to pipe it to the the lorries that take it onto the refinery they can then start to bootstrap the development themselves because as soon as they get a decent yeah. cash flow coming in from the sale of the oil it won't be very long before they can develop it properly and also they'll have the money to do the other exploration that they want to do. So yeah. I wouldn't have thought they need to raise terribly much as a proportion of their market capitalization to get themselves sorted out and producing. Very right, Richard. I mean, if you think about, let's say, 800 um, barrels a day is producing without artificial lift currently. Now, that would tend to drift off over time. But at sixty dollars oil, you're talking the best part of fifty thousand dollars a day. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it doesn't seem, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't seem they've got this horrendous uh, capital expenditure to go before they can start to to get to gain any any significant revenue. That, so you know, it, it's really it hinges on the exploitation license, I think, Keith. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Watch this space. So, bottom line is. I have a shareholder. I still like this company and which has near term catalysts. And once they get the uh, exploitation license, I think it will come back onto investors radar screens. And I expect the share price to stage a bit of recovery. I would agree. And actually looking at it, it seems quite a tempting, um, 
quite a tempting share to put a small amount into, Keith, because the, the upside is, is quite significant. Hmm. Glad, I'm glad you think so. Thank, thank you very much for the presentation, Keith. Very interesting, as always. And um, yeah, well done. OK, thank you, Richard. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that, that you will press like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you all for your feedback. Um, in the meantime, it's goodbye from Richard Wheater. And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. goodbye. Full disclaimer. The material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.